I'm assuming that uh, this piece we're about to hear is new to many of you, uh, the Elgar Piano Quintet. I think it's an absolutely wonderful piece, but it's not played that often. And so I thought I would tell you a bit about the backstory of it. It was composed just shy of 100 years ago. And the early years of the 20th century, as you know, were somewhat similar to the early years of our own century in the sense that it was a time of rapid technological advancement, and it was a time of uh, revolutions across the world. And of course, music itself and art and literature and, uh, and dance were all subject to the same revolutionary forces. And so you have the rise of such protean figures as Stravinsky and Schoenberg and uh, Vaslav Nijinsky and, uh, and, and, and others. And at this time, about 1917, I think it was, Sir El Edward Elgar turned 60. And he was beginning to come to terms with the fact that he was watching himself turn into a musical anachronism because he had been born in the middle years of the 19th century. And in this time of the rise of Stravinsky and Schoenberg, he was still paying his allegiance to Schumann and, to a large extent, composers like Brahms. And so he understood that he was sort of out of step with the fashions of the day, and this was somewhat difficult for him to digest. Also, he was melancholy over the slaughter of a whole generation of, of young men that had just taken place in World War I on the battlefields of, of Europe. And he was feeling uh, physically ill. And also, this was all compounded by the fact that he, like Dvorak, was really not a, a city person. He was born in the countryside of England, and he grew up under countrified circumstances. And he had married a woman to whom he was very devoted and who was very devoted to him. Her name was Alice. And she came from an aristocratic background. And so they were living in London, but she could see that this was not having a, a salutary effect on his psychology, and he had really gotten to the point where he couldn't compose very much or very well. And so she rented a cottage in a rural district of Sussex, and the cottage was called Brinkwells, and it had a thatched roof, and it was out in the countryside, and it was quite lovely. And in the same way that when Dvorak found himself in Spillville, Iowa, and suddenly his compositional engines were reignited. He felt the same way once he arrived at Brinkwell's. And he wrote pretty much all of his major chamber music from about 1918, 1919. He wrote his string quartet and his violin sonata and this lovely quintet that we're about to hear. And the piece itself has a kind of a narrative underpinning to it. It, it seems like it reveals some dark interior drama. And in fact, not far from where this cottage was that they were living in, you could look across the meadow and there was this rather spooky stand of bare, gnarled, dead trees. And a local legend had grown up around these trees. And according to the legend, at some point in the indeterminate past, a band of itinerant Spanish monks had wandered into the region and had settled there and had performed impious rites of some unspecified kind, which had so angered God that he punished them by turning them into that stand of trees. And Elgar himself was, he liked ghost stories. Uh, he, he liked writing them, and uh, he had a feel for this. And he wrote this piece sort of under the influence of that, of that legend. And he even said to a friend, it's ghostly stuff. That's how he put it. And I, I thought in the manner of the preface to some Victorian novel, I would give you a quick genealogical introduction to the, uh, the various musical characters because they're all introduced early in the first movement. And if you hear them, I think, and you know something about their associations, then it, I think it illuminates the rest of the piece. So the piece begins with a piano solo, eerie and slow, and it's punctuated by these hesitant little chromatic interjections in the in the other instruments. And the piano solo is based on the Gregorian Latin chant, Salve Regina. And I think that this is supposed to perhaps create this subliminal sound image of the Spanish monks creeping through the undergrowth of rural Sussex or something. Uh, I'll play it for you, uh, a little of the chant itself and then the beginning of the piece, and you'll hear the relationship
now the beginning of the piece. Spooky stuff. And then the next thing you hear is the sound of the three upper strings descending chromatically in this gesture which perhaps is supposed to be redolent of the sound of the wind groaning through the dead branches. And it's met by a rising, lamenting cello line, perhaps the ghostly voices of the monks. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and then it changes utterly, and you have music which is very resolute and, and strong and, and English, uh, sort of a 6-8 march, which to me actually sounds, again, rather Brahmsian. It sounds a bit like the third movement of the uh, Brahms piano quintet. British, you know, like rightio, and, uh, and then it fades back into that eerie wind music that we heard. And then again, something completely new and unprecedented, music that sounds like a Spanish dance. It's like the uh, piano has been transformed into an 88-string guitar and is accompanying these intertwined violins. And it's, it, it perhaps is meant to subliminally evoke the picture of the Spanish monks committing those impious acts. Very exotic. And then incongruously it suddenly heads towards Eastern Europe and the music becomes like something you might hear in uh, the palm court of uh, the Café Angois in, uh, in Vienna. We are coming to you live from the palm court of the Café Yangua. And after that, everything is, is based on that material, once you've heard that. And it seems to creep out of the forest and into the sunlight and then back into the abyss. And the second movement is just beautiful, uh, song-like, wistful, soulful English music. It, it really makes you want to stand up and put your hand over your heart. And the last movement returns to the blowing of the wind uh, from the first movement. And, and then very soon after that, you have these sweeping uh, a major gestures in a kind of a, a waltz, and the music becomes very uh, optimistic and positive, and you feel like, well, the problems are over. But if you keep listening, you'll hear the ghosts of the Salve Regina theme and the monks uh, from the Spanish dance and that uh, Hungarian salon music. It all comes back. But in the end, it is the triumph of this, uh, this music. I mean, you can kind of hear Elgar himself saying, you know, rightio, traditional music values have <laughs> Carried the day, <laughs> pip pip. So anyway, you'll enjoy it. I just thought that that would be a useful introduction if it's a new piece to you. So enjoy the piece. <laughs> <laughs> 